Welcome to As I Live and Grieve, a podcast that tells the truth about how hard this is. We're glad you joined us today. We know how hard it is to lose someone you love and how well-intentioned friends and family try so hard to comfort us. We created this podcast to provide you with comfort, knowledge, and support. We are grief advocates, not professionals, not licensed therapists. We are you. Today we are speaking with Kendall Lanning. Kendall is a certified child life specialist, certified yoga instructor, energy worker, artist, and author illustrator. She finds her creative outlet through painting and artistic expression. She was intuitively guided to write and illustrate a children's book that will help children cope with death and grief. Child life specialists work closely with pediatric patients and their families, helping them cope with hospitalizations, illness, trauma, loss, and bereavement. With an integration of her gifts, she listened to her calling to create the fox and the feather. The intention of this book is to enhance conversations of remembrance and the hopes to give peace to the grieving heart in knowing that their loved one is still with them. Also, at the back of the book, there are caregiver resources and activities. Kendall is currently working on several children's books that open conversations to address difficult topics while strengthening emotional and spiritual intelligence. She also facilitates individualized therapeutic sessions through many unique healing modalities. Hi, Kendall. Thanks so much for joining us today as we talk about how grief affects children. Before we dive into our main topic, would you please share with our listeners a little bit of your background? Um, yeah. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored. Um, following your guys' podcast and, um, kind of being passionate with, um, working with children and families in exceptional circumstances. Grief is a difficult topic to, um, talk about. And in your podcast, I love how you integrate so many different people and modalities and how, um, they are grieving or how they're using, um, different coping techniques and so can help in- inspire others. But I love that you guys say that we are you, and that is so important that we're out here sharing our stories and your story to inspire others. You know, I just think it's so amazing. So thank you for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. Yeah. And so my background is I have um, 25 years of experience in child development. And since I was young, I knew I wanted to work with um, children. And growing up, I was labeled by my mother as strong willed. So, um, <laughs> like I always kind of had that little fright in me, but I was super sensitive, um, labeled with, um, ADHD trouble in school, held back in second grade, then going through other adversities and trauma and things like that. Um, as I was beginning the field of child development, I was introduced to, um, the field of child life. So I became a certified child life specialist. Say so work with children in the hospital um, and helping them cope, children and families cope with illness, trauma, loss, bereavement, and the psychosocial care of children in the hospital. And so, um, and then I began the spiritual journey of yoga and spirituality, meditation, and all those things and, and integrating the two, um, child life and then the spiritual aspect. It is such a great way to integrate the spiritual and emotional intelligence for children. So I was working in the emergency department um, at Children's Hospital. And then I just kind of got a book downloaded, The Fox and the Feather, and wrote and illustrated that. And so now I'm kind of on this journey of strengthening children, helping them cope with strengthening their their trust muscles of spirituality and emotional intelligence. Thanks, Kendall. We've established through various episodes that everyone grieves differently that each person's grief is as unique as a fingerprint. So I would imagine this becomes even more complex with children. There are certain developmental phases as a child grows and matures. Is there a way to summarize what grief might look like for a child? Yeah, um, I like how you said um, fingerprint because um, grief does look different for everyone and definitely looks different for children. and. Um, in the back of my book, I actually have um, the developmental responses to grief. And, um, but I do want to say that these are just guidelines. And so you can find a lot of resources online and things 
but also remembering that these are guidelines and we want to take into account cultural differences, developmental differences, family dynamic differences. Um, and so really it's just kind of like encompassing, I guess, kind of what we have found through research. Right. Um, but yeah, in the back of my book, um, so yeah, it is about like grieving differently and the developmental stages. And so I was just going to kind of go over like a few things sure. of like what you might find. Okay. So with like ages like zero to two, um, a lot of times it'll be more of that behavioral crying, maybe sleep pattern, um, disturbances, um, eating patterns and things like that. It's a little harder to tell like if they're grieving or if they're just kind of having, you know, if they really understand what's going on, but we just want to make sure that we're tending to their needs as best as possible. I think ages about two to four, in my opinion, can be the most tricky to explain death because they think it's reversible. Mm -hmm. Um, They will also ask tons of questions. And that is pretty typical is that they're going to ask so many questions. Like they're going to rephrase the question, like on my birthday, you know, will they be there? And you have to kind of, and they, they try to rephrase a question so that you'll say, yeah, and tomorrow he'll come back yeah. or whatever that is. So it's um actually, and that can be hard for us, you know, as adults trying to explain that you're like, no, I've already told you that. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like understanding that, you know, you're going to find that, that they just, they want you to say, you know, they don't want to hear that it's not reversible and they might not even understand that concept. Then it goes um into like, and as they get older, then they start to understand that like, it's, this is, the death is not reversible. and. They might even have fears of abandonment and guilt and labeling emotions. They can start to actually kind of label them a little bit better and understanding that. And then they may have like a lot of roller coaster, the up and down one minute playing and really happy. And the next minute, maybe violent or whatever that may look like or a tantrum Mm -hmm. and they won't label it. But you may know that it's a grief bubble as an adult. That's why it's so important to tune into those emotions and, and, and be with the children. And like ages seven to 11, you're going to have, you know, a wide range of emotions. Again, they may even experience guilt, difficulty in school. And guilt is another thing is that, that did they do something wrong? Did they cause this right. kind of thing? And especially if it's something very traumatic, mm-hmm. addressing some of that and seeking professional help is really important. Also, difficulties in school, a lot of times difficulty concentrating. Um, we may have, we, you know, and, and that person may have passed away. And then they go back to school and they're back with their peers again. You know, we don't, and then we forget, you know, our teachers or whoever may forget that that child is grieving. So tuning into that. And then you have, um, you know, the older children, they may engage in risky behavior, um, substance abuse, self-harm, things like that. So that's just like the encompassing of like what grief may look like, mm-hmm. may, but everything, it's always just so different. But um, yeah, yeah, that's- Many times the first grief experience for a child is the death of a family pet. As a parent, you might suddenly think you aren't prepared for it. Uh, You're not sure what to say, how to say it, um, how to explain death to your child. This conversation may need to change as your child grows and matures, kind of like we just spoke about. But what do you suggest? Um, A couple of things here with the pet and grief. A lot of times, and when I was growing up, Fluffy went to the farm, you know, and a really great place with plenty of space to run and play. And, and, and you're like, oh, wow. And so they never have those hard conversations. We, I don't know, never really, it was not normalized. These conversations weren't, it was easier just to kind of say, we're going to take him to the farm and he's going to be good. And you're like, no. And you know that that animal might be sick. The thing is, is that five years down the road, they find out that you lied to them and you've lost their trust and, and be like, what else did you lie to me about? And yeah, that can really be hard on a child's self-esteem and self-worth. So really being aware of if you are or experiencing the loss of a pet um, is really making sure that you talk about death and where they're going and have maybe service and ceremony and remembrance and all of that so that they can come into closure with that. And then that goes along also with, people. And using words like death and died and being honest is so important. Another thing is that I recommend highly is preparing your child for death. They're going to experience it. It is inevitable. And, you know, even on TV, how much we're seeing it right now, death tolls are up. I mean, just on the news and commercials, everything. And so what is death? And then 
molding. And I, I believe that kind of molding or integrating that in with spirituality. So giving, so that's not so scary. And so whatever the religious belief is, whether heaven, angels, um, the universe, you know, spirit, whatever the terms are, making sure that family members kind of can identify a spiritual well, like sense of spirituality to connect with the kids so that they can use those terms. Like, so when they do have, you know, death or fluffy does say that, you know, we're going to take him to the vet, that his body is, you know, very sick and not working any anymore, but his spirit and his soul will still be with or his angel body or however you want to say that so that they're prepared and they know, you know, this is what happens after, after death. And it's not so shocking to them. And it's not this new concept. So not that only they're trying to understand what death is, but they're trying to understand that it just happened to them. So that at least it's like, all right, you got this piece done. They understand it. And even my book, The Fox and the Feather, it is light enough. I do feel to begin to open up topics before they even have that happen. And that's okay. And seeing sometimes things do that people, people die, animals die. And, and so, um, that's just kind of how I, um, recommend bringing up those difficult topics and preparing the child is, is really going to help in your favor as an adult and as a parent and as a caregiver. So, yeah. That, that's really great information and very helpful, Kendall. And I especially like, well, let me start a different way. For so many people, the term death is also connected immediately with heaven or hell, but usually heaven because they're not going to talk to their kids about hell for certain. But many, many people aren't strong believers in the heaven and hell concept anymore. There are so many diverse concepts out there. Many people don't know even what they believe. So they are at a loss for explaining. So I like the fact that you are pulling it away from the traditional religion, religious aspect, and saying it can be anything. So even if the parents aren't believers or don't really know what they believe in, they can use whatever terms they choose. I think probably one of the big things is be consistent and make sure when you first talk to your children about it, that it's something that you can grow with that same concept. So you don't fall into that changing the whole story and having your kids think you're just telling them lies. One of the other pieces about family is that there's generational differences too. Now, when I was a child, my parents might have been more apt to tell me that the family dog was just sleeping, went to sleep and he's not going to wake up. Well, then of course, children become terrified to go to sleep themselves or for anyone else to go to sleep. So I think it's important, and I'd like your opinion on this, to bring other members of your immediate family into the discussion, or at least bring them into the loop about how you're explaining it to your children. So there won't be these cross purposes or different stories depending on who they talk to, because I think that can be very confusing for a child. Wait, how do you feel about that? Yeah, for sure. Um, education is, and awareness is the number one thing um, I think that we can do in general. We know that people have good intention, you know, when they're saying that, or they don't know how to say it. Either where it's like, oh, they're sleeping. And you think about even the Disney story, Sleeping Beauty, you know, we'll kiss her and she'll wake up, yeah. you know. And but at the same time, everybody has the um their their good intentions in, in protecting children right. from what could be hard for them because they are hurting as well. We think about our own grief mm-hmm. and how we would never want our children to experience that. And so to say that, because when we say the word died, the vo- your voice may shake. It will. There's times where I have, I get lumped. I mean, I've been doing this work for quite some time. I've done lots of consultations and usually that initial, you know, died, you know, yeah. is hard for me. And I, you know, use, I've trained in it. And so for someone to not be trained in it, absolutely. It's so hard. So we know that it can be challenging, but in, in order to, you know, keep the communication flowing, I think it is important to, yes, educate family members and things and say, this is how we're explaining it, but also continuing to educate your child because inevitably your child is, you know, the one that is digesting all of this. So when you're saying to them, using those words, then when sleep comes, 
they may even ask you, well, they said they were sleeping. Right. And so, yeah, that's what some people say, because you can even prep them for that. They're going to be saying things like pass away, sleeping, you know, preparing them for the funeral. What is that going to look like? What is a casket? Giving them choices, whether they want to go to the casket. And then that is where the boundaries of family members, I think, even more would be, Mm -hmm. is to make sure that they know where their place is and having a designated family member that is educated to be with that child at the funeral, if that child goes to the funeral, or if that child chooses to stay back, giving them choices in that. Not making them walk up to the casket, but encouraging it Mm -hmm. and giving them, you know, maybe they want to bring up a flower, not just growing up empty handed. I mean, there's lots of different ways that you can kind of navigate through to, it's not essentially protecting your child from what other people may say or anything like that. You want them to be part of the grieving process and watching people cry and be part of this. But it also is important that um, parents try their best to, you know, prepare their children and then having those people that are educated and do know and that are you know, a good support system for the family to kind of help through that process with children. Mm-hmm. Okay, Kendall, in your opinion, what is the greatest challenge for children in understanding death? I think adults and children the same. Um, what is our challenge as humans to understand death? That's the question. Yeah. You know, we don't we don't know. And the biggest challenge with children, I think, is that I don't know if it's necessarily the children, but the adults and understanding how to explain it to them, they're really actually in tune and they do understand when you do it right. Mm -hmm. Um, I've done lots and lots of consultations and therapeutic modalities to help them connect with the heart center and infinite love. And so they actually, if you're doing it appropriately and you're giving them the coping tools and you give them that spirituality to believe in something greater, they can carry that with them forever. And so I just think with children, I think really the greatest challenge is almost us trying to learn how to navigate for them because they're resilient and they will understand and know, and they have been through a lot. And if they have the proper support and professional support in the family members and they're watching family grief properly, um, I do feel that we're waving in these new wave of children that are going to be more spiritually and emotionally intelligent to understand these concepts because death is sad and as as hard and as it is um it's also a beautiful part of life and that's the circle of life and it's navigating through tough emotions you know it, it's challenging but children honestly they're 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 amazing beings that are here to show us that it may be not be so scary so i don't really know if it's all really that challenging in, in my in my opinion I think you might be right though I think a lot of the challenges come from the fact that we're the ones that are trying to help our children through it and we're not through it ourselves so it, it's difficult to we want to try to put on a happy face but in reality it just hurts it hurts everybody so I think to to let your children know that you hurt also it's just one of those uncomfortable periods in life I think that's great Absolutely. And, you know, and children not being able to communicate or express emotions, you know, that is extremely challenging, you know, to be able to label the difference between anxiety and excitement. I mean, for adults, that's really hard. Right. So I think it's like encompassing, like we are all just big kids too. Mm-hmm. And it all <laughs> is going to look different. Good and <laughs> it's hard no matter what, you right. know, but it also doesn't have to be life ending per se. Right. We can move on from it. Yeah. And, you know, things like this podcast and relating and finding new modalities. We are here finding new modalities, what works, what doesn't right. work for everybody. It's so different. And so the same with children. It's so different. I come into grief sessions because I facilitate them with children and families. And I have just a whole bunch of different things that they can do from meditations to the scarf activity. Grief boxes are movement, yoga, what is it? And they have a menu of things. And then I find out what works for them. I meet them where they are. So it's really powerful. And I think that we're kind of drawing into that. We're getting out of the cookie cutter mold of what things may look like. Yes. Well said. Well said. I think that meet them where they are at is like perfect. We're realizing that that's what you just need to do because everyone is so different. We all are going to grieve differently. Um, I work in hospice and I've, I've seen it. I've seen the good, the bad, the ugly. <laughs> but I think too, like I know with my kids, I think asking, if you know and are comfortable asking your children, you know, what do you think it is? What do you think happens? 
when someone dies just to get what what maybe is in their head you know what they who knows what they could have heard on the school bus for crying out loud i mean that's where <laughs> and and personal story i remember my son coming home and that's where he learned about you know one of those lies of the man in the red suit and <laughs> was the school bus <laughs> You know, and I remember him coming to me and saying, you know, so-and-so on the bus said that that there isn't a Santa. And I was like, well, what do you believe? Like, that was my just initial gut instinct to ask him, what do you believe? And, you know, he told me, he's like, I believe in it. And I said, okay. I said, and then we had this conversation about how everybody believes in something different. Some believe in religion, so, you know. So I think talking about that, too, and because he's, the children are going to hear from their friends different things as well. Because maybe someone else's parents might not explain death. They're going to say, take into the farm for your pet. But, and I know we're about to talk about your book, The Fox and the Feather. That was a huge thing. Reading was huge for my kids. My mom is a writer, loves to read. My mother-in-law was a teacher. Um, and then at the end of her career, worked in the library at the school. I found explaining things to my boys was easier through a book for something for them to read and to go over and over again, read it again. And then they, it poses new questions each time you read it to them. And then having that conversation with them and answering their questions. And I think being truthful is the best way, but some parents might not agree with me. <laughs> well, then maybe they should listen to the podcast. And, <laughs> you know, just, just sometimes you just have to think a second time. Right. Uh, there was a great I can't even remember now where I heard it, but somebody said that to be successful and to get further ahead, you should argue like you believe you're right, but listen like you think you're wrong. And that's how you will absorb so much information. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we, we digress again because <laughs> it's so much fun. Kendall, I'm one, as Stephanie says, I love books and I would be just as apt to read your book, The Fox and the Feather, to an eight-month-old while cuddling him or her in my arms and trying to rock them to sleep, even knowing that they're not going to understand it. But sometimes the sound of your voice while you're reading provides a sense of comfort. At about what age do you think a child can kind of comprehend the actual story of The Fox and the Feather? Oh, that's a... Tough That's one? a good question. <laughs> <laughs> really good because honestly, uh, I'm a firm believer in heart centered communication, um, heart frequency. We're learning a lot more and more about the energetics of the heart and also knowing, I mean, even children feeling their mother's heart in the womb and then coming out and you're reading that story is a vibrational heart centered story. Hmm. So when it talks about like the vibration cuddling your eight month old or four month old, if you're healing your heart in that process, inevitably, you're syncing up in harmony with their heart. So you wouldn't want to shut that off and say, well, he's too young for that. Well, this book was downloaded from me by spirit. And so if it helps that parent, somewhere in their unconscious mind, they're beginning their development of like that cuddling and nurturing and understanding that when they turn 12 months old, they know that they're sitting in that chair reading that book remembering grandpa when they're two years old. Now they're really beginning to kind of understand it a little more. And then, you know, once they become two and a half to three, you know, you can even start bringing it up even more. So, you know, it's kind of in, like I said, all children grieve differently or developmentally understand things differently. But if you're tapping into the heart center, you know, reading this book can be for all ages, anyone. And that's where I'm even like, even teens. It's like inspiring them to create their own story, you know, and make up making the memory making activities of the scarf and stuff. So it's just kind of cool that I think that this book can truly integrate all ages. I was having a hard time putting that um, ages on it. I, I think you I think you just said all that very eloquently. And I wish I wish I had those words. I'm not that familiar with the, the heart centered or the heart feelings that you mentioned, but it, it just makes so much sense yeah. when I think about it now. So I think, well, I think every family should have this book. Yeah. I think every classroom should have this book. Every church should have this book in their library. As you mentioned, it's, it's a soft way to 
broached the topic of death. And I did not think, although you told me, that as I might be reading it to a baby who can't understand it, it's probably helping me too. There seems to be a great amount lately with Ancestry.com and 123.com about generations before us that your children are never going to know. This is also a great way to introduce that entire topic about how those people aren't there. But look here, for example, behind me are the medals from when my husband was in the army. Yet a child who years later might not remember grandpa or even great grandpa could look at that and make a connection with someone they had never met. And that would become like your scarf or like your feather. I always like to know when some other person writes and publishes a book, what made you write it? What was your why? So being a child, like, well, actually, I've like really wanted to write a children's book. I had so many different sketches and I didn't quite know. And working in the hospital, I was like, I, I don't know. And I had like a burn one and all, just a whole bunch of different ones and just like ideas. And then I was working in the, in the emergency department and I was having quite a few end of life consultations. And I'm like, I just want a quick book that like doesn't have a lot of words because some of those word ear books, I couldn't get through them. Right. And then I would just hand, or I knew that I couldn't get through them because it was just too wordy and you lose the kids and you lose family members. And then there's not, there wasn't a whole lot of takeaway, no activities that really go with it. Um, some of them do, you know, which is great. And then, or else she handed off to the family members in hopes that they'll read it and be able to digest it. And then I just, I was in the emergency department and I was working a lot with the fox as my spirit animal. Um, and he's clever and witty and tricky and, and kind of that little trickster about him. And I just, the fox was coming to me and I was using, we call it like fox medicine. And mm -hmm. the cardinals always come to me as like a sign saying I'm right on track. And then my spirituality with the feathers. And literally, I was sitting there one night, and it just downloaded. I knew exactly what the characters were going to look like. I sketched it out really quick. I knew the story. I wrote down all the words. I went home, and I stayed up until I worked till midnight. I stayed up till like 4 in the morning one night. And then uh, the next night, stayed up, and I finished it in two days oh my goodness. very quickly. <laughs> and it was done. And it took me three years to publish it. Because I knew that I would have to be ready emotionally, right. spiritually again. I'm strengthening my emotional, spiritual intelligence. I'm no different. That's why I like how you say we are you. Right. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm no master to any of this. So um, I just kind of feel like I, I wanted a book that I could just go in and, and talk quickly. Not quickly, but just it, here's this book and, and we're done with it in five minutes. And here's a scarf activity and it can get the children up to the bed and 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 really, I didn't even know the scarf activity until after the book was published, but it was perfect. I wanted an activity to go with it, but then spirit was like this. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And and so it just was, I wanted something for families. I didn't want to have religion with it because a lot of them say heaven and things. And if that's, yes. that's really hard concept mm -hmm. um, because there's so much more to it. And, and I wanted it to give them hope, you know, yeah, right. finding that feather for me has been huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Seeing those cardinals shifts my actual day. It mm -hmm. will turn yeah. my day around when I see a cardinal singing in a tree. Yeah. And I know a lot of people relate like that. So really, I did it. I didn't write the book. Spirit wrote it. Mm -hmm. I listened. I'm the messenger. I do not take credit for this at all. Like, I, I don't, like, you don't download something that quick and just have it happen that way. You right. know, I'm the messenger. Right. So I love that you, didn't you say somewhere, Kendall, that your, your angels had you write this book? My, yeah, my, my guys. Yeah. My guides, yeah, they're angels, they're guides, they're angels, they're spiritual yeah. beings, they're spirit, um, whatever. I don't really pin it onto an exact. I do have lots of spiritual guides, uh -huh. you know, in the, in the etheric realm, but I, I wouldn't say a certain one did. It was like all of them. It felt mm -hmm. like a rush throughout my body. Yeah. I was up for like two days straight, kind of. Like I slept a little bit, it was like up again to write it again. It was pure divine. And yeah, it was guys, angels, all the higher power, just like, psh, ack, it was like, I was, it gives me chills downloaded. when you say that. Cause I just yeah. think that that's so neat. And I, I told you on the, our phone call, I feel the same way about Cardinals. It's, um, I know that it's my loved ones coming to check on me. I see him in the backyard all the time. 
and it, yeah, when you see them, you're just like, oh, it just kind of puts you at ease, you know? So I definitely love that. And the illustrations in your book are just so cute. So definitely when you're reading it to a, a baby, they're going to see those images and they're just so cute of the fox and then the cardinal. It's adorable. Thank you so, so <laughs> much. So much. They, the illustrations, I mean, it's like it, I still cry reading through the book, you know, because I didn't write it. It's like coming from outside right. of me. So I'm like, and then, oh, like these characters, <laughs> you grow to love them. And, and, and it's just a beautiful story as well. I, I just, I'm honored to be here sharing it right yeah, now. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's simple to the point. And I think that it can, like I said before, that it can provoke questions from your child. You know, they can ask, especially if you got a, like a four-year-old, you know, they're going to ask 5,000 questions and why, why, why. But I just think it's, it's something good to just start the conversation. Well, Kendall, I think that our time is growing short for today. Uh, before we wrap up, I want to offer you some time to tell our audience more about you, things you're working on, what they might find if they visit your website, anything you'd like to share with them, please. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, so. I'm actually working on three other books, and one of them is Turtles in Transition. Super cute. Hopefully, that'll be out pretty soon. Not quite sure when. And at the end of all my books, <laughs> there will be parent resources and activities to go along with it. I think that's really important. I agree. And they're books that are going to address difficult topics. Um, there's a miscarriage book mm -hmm. as well. Wow. And um, an astrology book, and then I'm also doing a children's tarot deck in the making with the original, um, rat, um, with the original tarot. I have so that that's going to be, and it'll have a lot of symbolism in there. It'll be really interesting and help with with spiritual and emotional intelligence, and, and there'll right. be a journal along with that. And then I also do one on one um, grief sessions using my book and doing the activity, the scarf activity, and. Um, meditations, things like that. I call it finding feathers sessions. So it's here just locally in Omaha. I haven't done any of the grief sessions over Zoom, but I have done other sessions like my raising lions, um, which is coming soon as well. But I've kind of been launching that, which helps children, um, the lion, you know, the brave, the brave lion mm -hmm. that, um, is a leader. And so allowing kids to find their, their inner power and their inner source and, through a lot of the meditations and believing in the mystical, mystical realms of life and magic and crystals and all the healing things that I think right now are just so important. They've literally shifted me being sensitive in who I am. And once I tapped in and started doing this type of work, my whole soul shifted and it works. And lots of children and families that I work with, their parents say, oh, my child would never do that. They'll never mm -hmm. sit still mm -hmm. like that. You will find that they are excited to come back. They want meditation. They want spirituality. They want to connect to higher realms. There's nothing to fear. What we fear is what we don't know. Right. And what if we just say we don't know it and we open up to love? Mm -hmm. That is the main source. And so right. these programs that I offer and with the books, the guiding source is, is heart-centered. It's that bridge. And, and, we, and then things just aren't so difficult anymore. And that's kind of where I want to find that, that peace and that life mission of mine. Wow, this, yeah. this is also exciting. I'm, I'm excited about the books. And I know Stephanie will be immediately purchasing the book about the turtles yes. because that is her spirit. Yep. Animal. So she loves that. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it was your book, Kendall, The Fox and the Feather, which you both wrote with your spirits or your spirits wrote it directed through you. And you illustrated as well, which is a little bit unusual because many publishers would prefer to hire a separate illustrator. So I think it's incredible that it's solely from you, from your heart, mm -hmm. from your spirits. And I can't wait to see the others. If I might suggest, a book on foster care or adoption might also be a great one. Because I don't think there are many available out there. Or even one on blended families, I think, is so pertinent to today's society and many, many cultures. All of your contact information is going to be on our website. And also in the episode notes on the podcast apps for our listeners, we will also have a link to your book, The Fox and the Feather, so people can easily purchase it. Again, Kendall, thanks so much for your guidance and your insight today. I've learned so much, and I just truly, truly love that about our podcast. Uh, we meet some of the greatest people. Our network is expanding, and I just love everything that we're learning. 
to all of our listeners. We'll chat again next week, okay? Stay well, take care of yourselves as we all continue to live in grief. Thank you so much for listening with us today. Do you have a topic that you'd like us to cover or do you have a question from one of our episodes? Please email us at info at asiliveandgrieve.com and let us know. We hope you will find a moment to leave a review, send an email, and share with others. Join us next time as we continue to live and grieve together.